Hi guys, I'm going to give everyone uh, a quick overview of some, some quite cool stuff I've been doing. So we're going to look at physical access control technologies. So a quick overview of physical credentials like access cards, tokens, etc. So I look at biometric systems. And I'm going to take you through a worked example of a, a biometric system, one of my favorite ones, actually. And then we're going to have a look at a common attack uh, that they're all susceptible to. And I'm going to do a quick demo for you as well. So most of you should be aware of the kind of standard access control system. You tend to have an uh, access control reader on the outside. It may be biometric. Uh, obviously an electric lock on the door, generally a push to exit button on the inside. They all hook back to an access control system, quite simple. Slightly smarter system, uh, the actual access control system may be remote to the door, so it may be talking to a local door controller. And this one is actually configured as what they call an anti-passback system. So basically, you have to swipe to get out, they tend to use this with things like turnstiles. So you've got an exit reader, an entry reader, so you, people know that you're actually out the area. So we have, as you're all aware, aware of, the, the Mag Stripe card. Everyone's got one in their pocket right now. The Wigan card, uh, which we'll go into a little bit later. Proximity cards, again, most of you probably actually own one of these. The barium ferrite card, which you probably don't, you might have done like 10, 15 years ago. The concealed barcode card, which I hope you don't own. And uh, contactless smart cards. So, I am going to go through this stuff quite fast because it's just to give you a brief overview of how this stuff works. So, the concealed barcode card, it is as crappy as it sounds. <laughs> Basically, uh, it looks somewhat slimmer, similar to a MagStripe card. You've got a black bit that goes right to the bottom of the card, and that's IR transparent, and in the middle of that you've got a barcode. So basically, with a torch and a photocopier, you've got it owned. It is just fucking embarrassing. <laughs> if you see someone with one of these, I want you to shoot them. Max Stripe cards, so we're all familiar with them. Normally, they've got about three tracks. Uh, some manuf manufacturers kind of mess around with the standard track configuration. Uh, we've got two different st strengths of cards, basically high coercivity cards, quite a lot of driver's licenses are high co cards, and loco, they were the, the original kind of bank max strike cards, quite easily erase, erasable. Your hotel key will almost certainly be a, a local card. Uh, so the standards generally have three tracks at uh, different bit densities. They're read, read by an exposed uh, read head in the reader, which makes them a little bit vulnerable. And uh, when someone sells you a high security barcode system, or, sorry, barcode, max strike system, it can be as simple as they adjust the offset on the heads so the tracks aren't where your reader writer thinks they are. Or they can screw around with the, uh, the bit padding and things like that. So generally, you know, they're trying to protect something that's inherently not really protectable. They talk uh, a thing called clock and data. So you've got the clock signal on top and uh, just clocks out the data bits on the uh, data line at the bottom. That's what it actually looks like in real life. This is actually, I have to add, a very, very small part of my Visa card. Okay, moving right along. Barium ferrite cards, these were the original uh, card keys. They tend to use an insertion reader, but more modern ones I've seen have a you place the card flat on the reader. And basically, if you were to take a card, sprinkle iron filings over it on a sheet of paper, 
you'd see these discrete little magnetic domains. And that's how the cards are encoded. So if you break them open, it tends to look very much like a fridge magnet inside. And as I mentioned earlier, it was the original card key. The Wigan card. Now, this is where you've got to start paying attention. Wigan cards have a special alloy wire. Uh, and basically, it exhibits what's known as the Wigand effect. And as you see, the wire is embedded in the card in a distinct pattern. In fact, two rows. We have a row of ones and we have a row of zeros on the bottom. And that's a simple bit pattern. When you swipe it through the reader, there's a set of one readers and a set of zero readers, and it just lifts the code straight off the card. That's what one looks like, and if you actually hold it up to a bright light, you can actually see the discrete wires embedded in the card. And again, this arrangement's important because you'll be able to see what it actually looks like when we talk about the electrical protocol, and it looks stunningly similar. The Wigand effect, basically they thought this was so secure because the wire is really, really hard to manufacture. It's coaxial and the, the center is in tension and the outside is in compression. It's, it's all very wacky stuff. But the bottom line is you wave your bit of Wigand wire uh, past a, a magnet polarized in one direction and it kind of stores charge. And when you wave it past the charged wire, past an oppositely polarized magnet, it kind of dumps this magnetic flux, which with a small read head, uh, like a, a magnetic read head for a swipe reader, you can pick up this tiny little pulse. Now, that was how the, the card worked and the Wigand effect. Coming out of a Wigand reader, you've got this thing called the Wigand electrical protocol. And this is the thing that we're going to look at a lot later on. So basically, you've got three wires. You've got a one wire, a zero wire, and a ground. Here we can see the code for, that's being transmitted down this line at the moment is 1001011. It's that simple. The timing kind of can be quite flexible, but generally, uh, with the particular reader I'm looking at here in this demo, it's a dip of about 40 microseconds with about a two millisecond gap in between pulses. As you can see, if you actually look at it on a logic analyzer, it looks remarkably similar to the actual coding on the card. The logic analyzer trace here isn't actually of this card code, but when you put them side to side, yeah, it's very, very easy to work out what's going on. So, once we get the code out the card, through the reader and down the wire, this is how things are actually broken up. The standard Wigand format is 26 bits. So the basic Wigand system is a 26-bit system they're all over the place. 26-bit uh, is considered a universal format, and I'll go into a little bit about that later. But basically, what you have is 26 bits. The first bit and the last bit are parity bits. And then the 24 bits in the middle are chopped into a uh, site code and a card code. So generally, when you go to your vendor and say, right, I, I want a whole bunch of cards, they'll say, what site code? You say, oh, I'll have site code 102, and I want cards 1 to 100. Okay. Proximity cards, again, we've all got them around. They're passive. So basically, what's happening here is the reader is actually an emitting a magnetic field, an RF field, and it magnetically couples to the card. And as soon as the card gets activated, it 
literally just bursts data back. There's no authentication between the card and the reader. As soon as the card's energized, it starts transmitting its code. There are active cards, um, and they tend to be, have a slightly longer read range, and they emit their own field to the, uh, to the reader. Now, when you hold your proximity card up to the light, you think that basically it's like one of these store anti-theft tags, and you've got just a single uh, foil antenna. What you actually have is about a bazillion turns of the finest wire you will ever possibly imagine. And this is what happens when you take a proximity card and dip it in chloroform and dissolve the plastic. <laughs> now, I hasten to say I didn't do this, but uh, it works quite well. Not just for killing puppies, apparently. <laughs> okay. So, don't get proximity cards and RFID confused. Proximity cards are magnetically coupled. It's the same with your, your new biometric passports. They have a, a coil of wire inside, and they need to be quite close to the reader to actually get energized and transmit. Whereas true RFID tags can get hit from a distance, and basically they're true little lit radio transceivers you power them up on one frequency, and they transmit their code back on a second frequency. Generally, it tends to be a fraction of the energizing frequency. And with RFID tags, you can read them from a decent distance away. So, proximity cards. They barf back a single bitstream when they're energized. They're all Manchester encoded, generally, and in order to get the data from the card to the reader, that 26 bits that gets sent along the, the Wigand electrical protocol line, the card is sending back about 506 bits, super padded out with error correction. So you, you're 26 bits going down the wire from the reader, the card's transmitting about 506 to actually get those there. Now, when the manufacturers say, hey, I've got this really high security prox card. High security just means they've added a few more bits or they've changed the bit length so they're not quite standard. But they still get transmitted down the wire in the same manner. Another way they do it is they say, right, for a mere X million dollars or whatever they decide to charge that day, they restrict site codes. So someone may come up and say, right, I now have this new 64-bit uh, format, and I'm only going to, I'm going to sell you your own site code, Mr. Microsoft or Mr. Intel or whoever. And basically, they get a site code that the manufacturer will only issue to them. It's like having do not duplicate keys. In general, if you buy a stock system off the shelf, it'll be using 26 bits. So, contactless smart cards, not proximity cards, but they do tend to use the same magnetic coupling. They're, they're a higher frequency because they're, they're a little bit smarter. And in my humble opinion, it's the way to go. They're quite smart. They can do strong crypto, they authenticate between the card and the reader, so the card's not just barfing its secrets back. And, you know, generally reasonably secure. The Philips MyFair system uh, is used for stored payments. Uh, the London Underground implemented one called the Oyster Card, just recently using MyFair which would have been uh, immensely secure had the, uh, had the key not been the same key as the programming example in the manual. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's sad but true. However, you know, one would hope people learn from shit like that. Okay, so on to biometrics. Retina scanners. The old iris scan, which they're now implementing at quite a few airports. 
uh, a new one for me, which is venial hands and finger maps, hand geometry, a perennial favourite, and the old fingerprint scanners. Well, basically, a simple image capture and compare, and you'll come across that again and again with uh, biometric devices. Fingerprint scanners tend to use two technologies, two main technologies, optical, uh, which you've all seen, glass platen you put your finger on, and the kind of gold platen, which actually uses capacitance to create the image. And that's exactly what it does. It creates a, a, a single image of your fingerprint. Uh, everyone by now has seen the Mythbusters episode. Gummy bears licked photocopies, which is the saddest thing ever. And, uh, you know, it's like, why bother making a silicon fingertip when you can lick a photocopy? So, generally, the way these systems work is you've got your image, and as you can see here, there are certain fingerprint features that a standard uh, forensic uh, analyst would look for, things like uh, enclosures, uh, bifurcations where the, the ridge splits, little islands, and, uh, and when the ridge actually ends. And they use that to create a map. Now, here's the thing, and here's the scary thing about fingerprints, and all, a lot of biometrics. You've got an image, and from that point onwards, it's just image processing. So when you buy that fingerprint scanner, you've got to think, who was the programmer that actually created the algorithm? You know, they get given a picture of a fingerprint, and someone had to sit down and create an algorithm to identify that fingerprint. How much do you trust them? Hand geometry scanners, uh, a bit of a fave. They're super easy to use. Uh, however, in general, so this is highly embarrassing, uh, a lot of people's hands are actually the same, or very similar. So uh, when I was showing my next door neighbour, uh, who now has a set of keys to my house, how to, how to get into some of the more secure areas, I enrolled him with the hand geometry scanner. And as we were kind of proving, I'm like typing in his code and he's putting his hand in, it's great. Then I accidentally type in my code and he puts his hand in and it opens the door. So they're coming out soon, basically. But uh, in general, again, it's another image. One of the problems inherent with biometrics is getting your image squared away. So here, there are little pegs that the user lines his hands up again. And uh, there's a whole set of little LEDs on the top of the reader that go out when your fingers are in the right position. You put your hand in, you close your fingers up against the pegs, takes a snapshot, and then analyzes it. And actually with this, I thought it was quite a cool hack. Some guy realized that just this side of the reader, there was a space, there's a camera up here taking the picture down. There was enough space to put in a 45 degree angle, uh, angled mirror. So at that point, you now get this image, which is across the side of the hand. So there's a little reflective surface here. And uh, that must have made them jump for joy because they then released this, which is the hand scanner 3D. So a new one that I haven't actually played with yet is the, uh, the venal hand scan. This uses an infrared camera. It's another, it's another image capture. As I said, they all are. And you can see with these, uh, this set of three images, here's the hand, here's the hand, in IR, and when you process it and take the hand away, this is what you get, the actual map of the, of the veins, which are analyzed just like the fingerprint to create the actual identifying map. Now, I actually enrolled with this uh, 
coming back into the UK or going out from the UK, you get now to enrol in their iris scan program. And uh, I thought, great, I'll have a go. Again, it's just an image. If you've got high-res camera, yeah, some potential problems with you know snatching things as people glance by. And uh, one of the problems with it I noticed was the first time I used it, my passport had expired. And I thought, yeah, I'll give it a go anyway. Ding lets me in. I'm like, okay, so one of two things have happened. Either it hasn't identified me as me, or they haven't put in the fact that my passport expired like six months after I enrolled. One of the problems with this is you should use bi biometrics to verify the identity of someone. You should not use them to identify people. So what they should have done is had me scan my passport and then scan my iris. At that point, I know they're comparing it with my template. They know I'm me, or they're comparing me with the template that I enrolled with. When you start to take something and just say, oh right, this matches, you didn't even say welcome back Mr. Franken. Uh, I could have been anyone. My absolute favorite, I own three of these. <laughs> the retina scanner, also known uh, from Uncle Ira as the rectal scanner. That is actually a big brown stick fixed to the wall, but we won't go into that right now. Okay, it's one of the things that's most secure. As a credential, it's very hard to steal. The only problem is, not very easy to use. You, you absolutely have to be trained how to use these things, and it needs practice. You can't use them with glasses, so you've got to take your glasses off every time you use it. Manufacturer went bust. Bit of a fucker. Okay, so I'm going to use this and take you through a, a bit of a worked example just to show you how biometric systems tend to work. So, first of all, user enters a code on the reader. This is a good thing. So we're, we're matching me with my template. And then a visual dot and a little target are displayed in the eyepiece. If you ever use one, before you look in the eyepiece, make sure you've got your finger on the scan button because you're going to need to press it. So you look into your eyepiece and literally you shuffle your head around so the dot is in the center of the target, and then you hit the scan button. And then you hold still, because it takes about a second. So, bit of a pain in the arse. If you wobble a bit, the, the initial ones used to have a head bar that you rested your head on. I uh, weren't popular with users. It's like, I don't want his cooties. Uh, so, and they all have a to, they all have a variance factor to, to handle this this you know my head wasn't in the right place, if it's the fingerprint my finger wasn't you know quite centered correctly or it was skewed. So no two reads are ever ever going to be identical. If they ever are, it's a miracle. It's like a one in a thousand. So you need a bit of fudge in all of these devices. So here's the retina. It is not mine. <laughs> and here's the target as it looks lined up. And imagine this being projected onto the back of the retina. I hit the scan button. And the scanner, which actually a retina scanner has lots of little whizzy spinning mirrors, like proper old school tech. I, it, the scanner activates. And it literally looks at a circle around your eye. It, it scans that circle. And then it goes to process it. So basically, effectively, it straightens it out and deals with it like it's almost a barcode. As it moves around, it says, OK, at 46 degrees, I got a, a black splodge and another one at 88. 
163, 179, and this generally creates your, your template. Surprisingly enough, on the original ones, template's exactly 360 bits long. Now, it, as it says here, did change on later models, but it shows you how the implementers of these things think. Yeah. You've, got, you've got your retina scan, how are you actually going to deal with it? My fave. Cool as fuck. Problems are uh, alignment. So it's totally subjective. So remember a couple of slides back when I showed the target in the center of the retina? Well, that is where I perceive the center of my vision to be. It may not physically be the center of my retina. So it's almost like having a brain print with, with the retina scan. Because where it's projected on the back of the retina, you know, as I grew up, the nerves, as they developed, said, this is the center of your retina. It may not physically be the center, but that's where I perceive it to be. You've still got a bit of fudge factor, so there's still a bit of leeway allowed. And your ID generally tends up to be a hash, which is not always fantastic. So, in biometric systems, there's two key statistical things that, uh, statistical things. Basically, you've got your false acceptance rate. How many times are your users going to get bounced when they try and scan their way into, into the building? And then there's the false, uh, sorry, I've got them the other way around. The false reject rate, how many valid people do I kick out because the scan was bad? And then there's the false acceptance rate, which, especially for the military people, they really don't want to be high at all, is how many bad guys actually got in because it misidentified their scan. You've got to tie it with the user ID. It's really, really, really key. OK, we also have another problem with biometrics. Once I've enrolled my hand or my finger and someone duplicates that, how are you going to deal with credential revocation? <laughs> it's a bit of a sticky wicket. Uh, now this is bad, not quite as bad as... <laughs> so, yeah, ouch. Okay, so with all these systems, as I said, this was just a background to what I'm actually going to talk about. There is a bit of a common problem. So, backwards compatibility, not always great. Going back to Wigand, when they came out, everyone wanted Wigand cards. So all the access control manufacturers implemented the Wigand electrical protocol uh, so they could interface with Wigand readers. And they still do. So everything we've talked about today, from the crappy barcode reader to my fave retina scanner, talks Wigand out its back end to the access control system to say, yeah, this guy is actually allowed. It's plain text. It's easily intercepted. It's easily replayed. It includes the biometric readers, and it also includes output from strong crypto readers. So basically, you've got your card, it's doing a strong crypto handshake with the reader, great. And then the reader goes, oh, access control system, have everything in YGAND. So I decided to come up with a device that would record YGAND IDs, replay them back, it needs to be small, because we're going to have to physically access it, the wiring. Make it easily installable, and uh, cheap would be good. That raised certain problems. How do we actually control it once it's installed in the wall behind a reader? And 
also, how do I work out when the, the card reads are actually good reads? And I'd quite like to get the data out every once in a while, so how am I going to do that? Now I'm drying up, so I'm going to get a glass of water. This is where I spill the water over my laptop and end the presentation. Okay, so generally these readers, this is a classic example of how a reader is connected. You've got positive and negative to power the reader up. You've got an LED line that comes from the access control system to say, yep, they're allowed. And you've got your data one and data zero Wigand data lines coming from the reader. Say hello to Gecko. It uses command cards to control the functions. It uses the access allowed LED to make sure we got the card right. And it also uses the access allowed LED to download data out of the reader. That's my fave. So once you insert it into the system, you see it. Uh, actually intercepts the LED lines and the data lines to and from the system. Now, Maggie, can I just grab you a sec? Uh, can you hand one of these to each of the three banks and just have them hand them around and hand them back? Right, so if you just pass these around, pass these along, and eventually they'll get to the back of the room and then someone will steal them. Uh, <laughs> They are empty, however, so, uh, so you're shit out of luck. You just scored a bit of plastic. So this little device is, uh, has two quick connects on either side, these guys here. Uh, so you just literally cut the wires, poke them into the, the quick connects, and just crimp down, and it's in. So, I'm going to give you a little demo. It's a demo, so it's not going to fucking work. But <laughs> if it does, I'm going to take all the credit for it. <laughs> okay. So, here we have. Can everyone see this from that corner? Okay. Here we have a simple access control reader. And remember, don't focus on the reader because the reader isn't the problem. The YGAN protocol is the problem. And this is talking to a tiny, tiny access control system, which happens to know about two cards. So. I'm going to power it up. And can I have Maggie and Helen? There you go. That was good. There's going to be a lot of RF flying in here, and this particular demo isn't shielded. So, so here are our valid users. Maggie and Helen, say hello. And here we have our bad user. Okay, so Maggie, would you like to swipe for us? We like Maggie. Helen? Can we have the volume up a little bit? And we have our bad user. Okay. Nah, you're not getting in. Okay, and we also have our three mystery cards. We have card A. Denied. Card B. <coughs> denied. And card C. <coughs> denied. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I have the same thing you're looking at, except it's already in a little harness so I can plug it in without fucking around.
Sorry? Oh no, it, it would just be random noises. Like lots of eh <laughs> And it, and it always gets the first one wrong. Come on. There we go. Sorry, it's just a little soundboard needs to initialize. Okay, so now we have, uh, we're back in, we've plinged this off. As I said, two screws and a plastic cover. It's not hard. You pop the, pop the cover off, install Gecko. Screw it all back onto the wall. Is it, it is your knife. <laughs> I borrowed it. Uh, okay. Now you made me forget where the fuck I was. You <laughs> bastard. <laughs> you may be getting your knife back very shortly. <laughs> okay. So, Gecko's now installed. Uh, can we try with our bad user? <coughs> no, he's still fucked off. Helen? <coughs> we like Helen. Maggie? <coughs> Mystery card A. <coughs> card says, replay. So now, basically, it will replay back valid users. This particular unit won't because I'm not trapping the uh, LED, but uh, it's just an old demo unit. So, everyone can get in normally. Now, so can I. Like that. Okay, mystery card number B. Yeah, it's working fine. Helen? Bad user? Maggie? Hey, I can still get in. <laughs> Card says disable. And, uh, oh, I guess I'll let you guys back. Card number C, or card C. Bad user? <coughs> Maggie. <coughs> and of course I can still get in. <coughs> so. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do as well. Now this is in place. Uh, let's see. Actually, you guys can sit down. We're good, thank you. Thank my helpers, please. Sorry. And thank your bad user, Steve. Okay, so this is version one. It's a proof of concept. It has a very basic feature set. It records, it replays, and it can disable users. Oh, and it can dis enable them as well. Version two, which I'm currently working on, and I didn't have my, my demo version ready for you. It uh, can store multiple IDs, and it writes them back to the, the flash and the chip. We monitor the, the reader line so we know that we actually got, we were actually capturing good cards. Download via reader LED. So basically, there are other systems that allow you to emulate, emulate these cards and actually by presenting something to a reader. So this would enable me to actually install one of these guys at the, the reader at Smoker's Corner. Every office building has one and uh, just record everything going in and out of that door. Then dump the data out, because I happen to have a dump card. So hold my uh, reader device against the LED, swipe my dump card, and it'll dump out the data to the reader. The reader's just another little pick chip.
I can load data back into the to Gecko via command cards. Slightly comical. I have my program card and I have my one and my zero cards. So <laughs> program one zero 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 one one. End program. So, version three. Now, this is all good for uh, kind of swiper proximity card readers, but I don't have a whole bunch of, of retinas to, or you know, irises to, to present to a biometric reader. Uh, so, version three is Bluetooth controllable. See. So perfect for biometric devices, so once it's in the wall, access via Bluetooth, can download and upload from it. And then there's version 4. Now, version 3, slightly larger because of the Bluetooth, slightly physically larger because of the Bluetooth interface. In fact, I, what's in those I, devices, make sure you're still passing them back, because the guys at the back aren't going to get it to the end of the talk. I, Basically, the biggest problem here is physical, the size of the physical connectors. Everything else can be reduced to surface mount and made real small. There's actually a dual inline chip and socket in those. So, as you can see, it's not actually filling out the size of the device. Uh, as, so, the Bluetooth one's slightly larger. And then there's version 4. GSM, <laughs> because that little guy there actually, believe it or not, is not only a fully functional GSM phone, that one happens to have GPS in it as well, and it's slightly bigger than that quarter. And it's programmable in Python. <laughs> and they're 50 bucks each. It's like, yes! <laughs> so, I've been... Uh, absolutely sprinting through this uh, because I thought I had quite a lot and the earlier stuff I really went fast on. So basically that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I, I'd like to say thanks to Video Man who, ma who made my uh, demo stand and uh, thanks to Major Malfunction who's somewhere here for keeping me sane when I was doing my PCB design. And uh, basically any questions, especially the, uh, if you didn't get any of the earlier stuff, because um, I know I've got a bit of a Scottish accent and I probably went a bit fast. So, questions from the floor? I would network the hand biometric ones. I, tend not to use, they tend to use their own network to talk between themselves and exchange templates, but they don't, they use YGAN to talk back. So that's where you'd use the, the Bluetooth model. Ah, tamper switches and readers. You'd be surprised how many readers don't have tamper switches because this one doesn't, and I haven't actually come across one that has. So there are, there are a few out there, but it's a bit of an issue. I, I'm using pick chips, so I, about, uh, well, hey, I need something easy. I, a couple of bucks for the actual units. But, uh, yeah, not hard. It's actually quite easy. And this can be inserted, this can be inserted at any point in the cabling system. So, for example, if you look at the wind tower across, across the road, they've probably done their first fix electrical already on some of the stuff on the ground floor. So the cabling is in there. They're waiting for people to pop readers on the doors. So 
this could already be installed, stuffed up a conduit, just waiting for the sparkies to put the readers on and hook them up at the other end. Sorry, say that again, please. Okay, uh, the question was, what about boards that have controllers built into the readers? Well, they're the, the most vulnerable things ever, uh, because if you defeat the tamper switch on that, you've got access to everything, because all the, all the data quite often is stored on the actual device. So not, not great. And actually, the biometric devices, the retina scanner, holds all its templates in the actual scanner on the wall. It gets pushed out from a, a central scanner. Normally you say, you're the master. It pushes out the templates to all the, uh, the other scanners over its own network, but it uses Wigand to talk back. And if you have a standalone version Quite often the standalone versions rely on you not having an access control system and most of them, most of those biometric devices have contacts inside for standalone use. So if you defeat the tamper and get it off the wall, you can just hit the tamper switch and you're all set. Sorry, hit the uh, access control contacts and you're good to go. Mm, will I be releasing the design? It's, it's not hard to do, so I'm probably going to shy away from that because there's no immediate easy fix for this. I, I mean, Wigand is very widely used, and uh, apart from installing tamper switches on your readers, which again is not particularly fantastic, it's, it's a bit of a tough thing, really. We're talking about replacing readers it's old technology, it's been widely adopted, so it's going to be a real problem. Uh, the question was, does it do pin numbers as well? Some, uh, you, there's quite a lot of Wigand uh, pin number readers, so you can actually enter your pin number on the pad and it actually transmits Wigand back. So yes, uh, if you if it's a Wigand pin pad, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of really cheap ones around that aren't that don't talk Wigand. Uh, but if you're actually interfacing a pin pad with a proper access control system, it'll use Wigand, most likely. Anyone else? Sorry. Uh, the question was, is it possible to mount one beneath the cover? Well, actually, beneath this cover, there's, a, there's actually quite a lot of space. And I don't know if you can see this. It's all covered in epoxy compound. All the cables come through the back, so it would involve a bit of a solder job. But yes, it's perfectly possible with, with this style of, or particular style of reader. Oh, the power straight from the reader power. Uh, I mean, 12 volts, it's, it's there for me to use, so I may as well use it. Well, that's, that's, that's where your uh, kind of fudge factor comes in. Uh, so basically, with all these biometric systems, there is a a kind of variance factor. So basically you, you tend to set them, okay, I'm going to say any scan can have a 10% variance, which is actually quite tight. Uh, or, you know, you can make it bigger and bigger and bigger. I, I don't know exactly how they're doing it in the, the case of the retina scanner. Cool. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much, guys.